Hello, and welcome to our next week of Story of Christianity. Last week, we discussed the Middle Ages and the various formations of the church throughout that period. Today, we're going to be moving into one of my most uh, favored parts of church history, the Reformation. We'll be spending the next two weeks looking at the various movements for reform, both inside the Catholic Church and without, in the 16th century. Today, we're going to be focusing on the background to the Reformation, what forces in the Middle Ages led to this momentous event that would change European history fundamentally, and then we'll be looking at the life of the man who sparked this radical change, Martin Luther, and his theology. At the end, we'll be looking at the Swiss Reformation that was led by Zwingli, and then later taken up by Calvin, which would give the formation to what we know as the Reformed tradition. One of the things we're doing in this lecture is asking a rather simple question. How is it that Europe changed from looking like this in 1400, and we might even say 1500 as well, as uh, including the removal of the Islamic areas in Spain, how is it that this continent, which was unified in religion since the time of Charlemagne or even earlier, in by the end or mid of the 16th century looked like this, with competing confessional traditions carving up what had been a unified religious sphere, with different traditions such as the Lutheran tradition taking uh, hold in the Holy Roman Empire and Scandinavia, and with large swaths of Calvinism or the Reformed tradition in Switzerland, the Netherlands, southern France, Scotland, and even England, which will have its own unique flair. What events transpire to most um, drastically changed the religious makeup and practice of an entire continent in just 50 years' time. To understand this, we need to take a step back and return to the Middle Ages and see what forces were at work that ultimately led to this shift in the religious makeup of Europe. We ended our last time talking about the winds of reform and the tensions that were left at the end of the medieval period. People had grown quite um, frustrated with the institutional church at the time. There was widespread financial corruption in which um, the papacy, especially in the time of the Renaissance, would accrue great wealth to itself, living a life of luxury. There was the abuse of power. We saw some of this in the tensions between church and state. This was also seen down to the level of bishops, um, with many bishoprics being left empty or um, the bishop not residing in the in the seat where they were assigned, as well as bishoprics being bought and sold. Many wealthy noble families would send off a younger son into the church, uh, with some bishops being in, in their teens um, without any real qualification for the office. In addition to this, there was general immorality and absence of the clergy. Many average people would not see a priest for years, and when they did, they were generally a hireling, not actually well-trained, and mumbling through the mass in Latin, which very few people could understood could understand. Uh, in this period, there was a deep desire for reform, and we saw some of these reform movements earlier in the Middle Ages. As the church would go into some sort of decline and corruption, uh, people of goodwill returning to the scriptures and the foundation of the Christian faith would seek to revive it. Revive it. We saw this in the friars and elsewhere. I want to signal out two uh, movements that developed in the late part of the Middle Ages to show how this came about, and these are generally referred to as the Proto-Reformers, one of whom is John Wycliffe, who you see above me. He was an English scholar and theologian who worked out of Oxford, and he spearheaded a reform movement in the English church that attempted to bring the Bible to the people in the language they could understand. So uh, throughout all of the Middle Ages, the uh, authorized edition of the Bible in the Catholic Church was called the Vulgate, which had been translated by Jerome in the 5th century. This text was still in Latin, and it was largely kept away from the populace. The authorities of the church worried that if the Bible got into the hands of lay people, this would just be a hotbed of heresy. Wycliffe pushed against this, arguing that the Bible needed to be read by the people. He also pushed against issues of papal authority, and even the Eucharistic doctrine of the church. He would found a movement known as the Lollards later, who would be influential in some ways preparing England for the coming of the Reformation. Wycliffe was able to live out his life largely through the support of secular leaders, especially of a man named John of Ghent, um, but after his death his, his body was exhumed and he was burned as a heretic and poured into the Thames. However, the ideas that Wycliffe put forth would spread throughout Europe. And one of the main people that this influenced was the Bohemian priest Jan Hus. Bohemia being the um, eastern 
southeastern part of present-day Germany. Huss was influenced by Wycliffe and tried to bring his ideas to bear in the empire. He argued that the spiritual authority was not based purely on the office of the priest, but rather on a person who led a holy and virtuous life. This is a shot against the corruption of the local clergy. He also argued quite radically for the time that scripture was the highest authority in the church. Throughout most of the Middle Ages, scripture is seen as on par with church authority and especially tradition. So we could glean understanding of God from scripture, but also from what the church had said in the past. And in the Middle Ages, this was relegated, this was regulated by the Pope. The Pope was ultimately the final authority of deciding the truth of theological claims. Huss also um, advocated for the the lay people were receiving the Lord's Supper under both species. What this means is, during the Middle Ages, um, when the laity, that is the non-clergy, received the Lord's Supper, they would only receive the bread. This was because of the medieval understanding of the doctrine we call transubstantiation, which I'll explain more later. But on the whole, what was going on here was the people were not seen to be responsible enough to hold the cup. And because this cup was truly, in the view of the Roman Catholic Church, the blood of Christ, they were afraid that the, the lay people might spill it. And so on the rare occasions when the lay people would take communion, which was a, roughly once a year, they would be only given the bread. Huss argued that this is not this should not be the case. When Christ instituted the Lord's Supper, his disciples received both bread and wine, and the same should be practiced in the church following after the commands of the Lord. Um, Huss also argued for a view of some sort of justification by faith. This was not an unknown position in the Middle Ages, but it was definitely a minority position. For these ideas, Huss was ultimately burned as a heretic at the Council of Constance in 1415. This is the same council, if you recall, that uh, brought an end to the Great Schism. And so, while there were good that came out of this council with the deposing of uh, the rival popes and the appointing of a new one, it also saw the death of one of the great reformers. Jan Hus's followers, known as the Hussites, would continue to operate in what is present-day Czechoslovakia, sorry, present-day Czech Republic, uh, until the Reformation period, and they would actually kind of merge into the emerging uh, reform tradition. Two more broader movements I want us to look at help us set the context for the dissatisfaction in the late medieval church for the current situation. The first being conciliarism. It's in this, in light of the growth of papal power throughout the Middle Ages that we've seen, especially under the Gregorian reforms and then through later popes, and the the tragedy that was the Great Western Schism, a movement arose that saw councils as superior to the popes. And you can see why they thought this, especially since the Council of Constance had in fact dethroned three rival popes and appointed another one. And so this was an idea that the papacy was not the highest authority in the church, but was, subs which was subordinate to the collected will of the bishops. This idea would not catch on and it would ultimately be dealt a death blow with the rise of the Reformation. But these ideas, questioning papal authority, looking at the authority of the church vested not in the hierarchy, but in some ways collectively among the people, would be a very influential movement and would um, give some precedence for many of the ideas that we'll see crop up in the Reformation period. The second movement is called Renaissance Humanism. And this was a result of the return of scholars to the primary sources. This began in the 14th and 15th century, largely in Italy, and would migrate to the north, especially the area of Flanders in present-day Belgium and the Netherlands. In this, scholars attempted to return to the original text, especially the original text of the Bible. This entailed learning Greek and learning Hebrew, so that they could interpret the text as closely to possible as it was written. Uh, this movement was actually bolstered by the fall of Constantinople in 1453 that we discussed last time, in that many scholars who could speak Greek fled to the West, and there was new resources to engage with the original text. They've, these people argued that we need to return to a classical understanding with a more thorough um, attention to the nature of language, to the nature of rhetoric, and that from this we can gain a greater grasp of God. This was a movement against the reigning method of scholasticism, with, which at this time had in some ways become decadent with very precise logic and had seemed to 
be removed from the pastoral and theological needs of the people. So both of these movements, humanism and conciliarism, in some ways uh, till the ground for what will later sprout as the Reformation. There's one more change I want us to mention, just so we don't forget that um, history is not only brought about by ideas, but by technology and society as well. One of the inventions that, had it not come about, the Reformation would have uh, died a very quick and silent death, was the invention of the printing press. Uh, this was a vast um, improvement over current methods of copying works. This allowed ideas to spread much quicker and cheaply and allowed for um, many more people to enter the conversation. Just to give you an idea of the an insane amount of changes going on here, the difference between the amount of pages that could be printed a day by the printing press versus handwriting, which was the only way to copy books up to this point, was 90 times. You could produce 90 times more pages of writing in a day than previously. And this would allow the ideas of the Reformation to spread quite quickly as printing centers cropped up across Northern Europe, especially. And in this, it was also possible for the lay people who could read, which was a growing amount of the population, to read the scriptures for themselves, to engage in theological debate, to see what this crazy monk Luther was actually saying, and see if this actually stood up to what the Bible itself taught. With these ideas in our mind, the vast technological change, the movements of discontent, and the corruption of the church, let us move to the man who ended up being the spark of the Reformation that would change not only Europe, but much of the modern world. Luther is in some ways a bigger-than-life figure. It took a man like Luther in order to spark the Reformation. He was undoubtedly a genius. He was a great religious thinker. He was also extremely rough around the edges and could be quite brash um, and even obstinate at times. Luther was a man who struggled deeply with his relationship to God, wondering how is it that such a sinner could come to be loved by this God. He had a very interesting life and did many things, and today I'd like us to look at his influence in the Reformation, his main ideas, and some of the main events of his life. In order to understand why Luther did what he did, we have to take a step back and understand what was he up against at the time. The event that ultimately sparked the Reformation came about because of Pope Leo X. You see, Leo needed money. There was an effort in Rome to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica, which you see above. How was the church to gain enough money to um, hire the Renaissance artists to uh, curry the marble, to bring all these craftsmen from around Europe together? And so what the Pope decided to do was to sell indulgences. So an indulgence was a form of penance issued by the Pope that people could buy to reduce a soul's time in purgatory, either their own or a relative's. To understand how an indulgence worked and why the church thought this was something that was possible, we have to look at the medieval view of salvation and how the church functioned as the mediator of God's grace to the people. And to do this, I want us to look at this flow chart, helpfully put together by Ryan Reeves. It goes like this. A person is born into a state of original sin. They are guilty before God. If they come to the church, they are baptized. According to medieval Catholic teaching, by this baptism they receive grace and the stain of original sin is washed away. Their will is now in the ability to choose God or reject God. Being baptized, they enter into a state of grace. This grace is something that is given through the sacraments, but it also can be lost. When one sins, especially mortally sins, there is a distinction here between a venial and a mortal sin. To die with a mortal sin, which is one that leads to death, um, is to go to hell. And therefore, if one is sinned in this way, what is required is that you go and you confess orally to a priest. You go to a priest, you confess your sins to him, and he will then give you absolution. This is actually the priest forgiving your sins. If the priest does not do this, your sins are not forgiven. Therefore, the clergy in this system function as a mediator of grace. One cannot have mortal sins forgiven unless they are confessed to a priest and absolution is received. 
Once you have confessed to a priest, you will be given an act of penance. A penance is a way to um, prove the sincerity of your confession, and in some ways accrue merit so that one can return into this state of grace. And it's at this stage that we need to understand an indulgence. So throughout the Middle Ages, there's debate about what constitutes penance. This originally would come to such things as saying a set number of prayers, um, or such aesthetic practices as fasting a certain amount of time. We saw some of this coming out of the um, Irish monastic tradition as well. Over time, it came to be seen that, well, one could go on a pilgrimage, for instance, in order to, um, to do their penance. Well, what if one was busy? They couldn't go on a pilgrimage. Um, but what if they gave money to the site of relics or uh, pilgrimage sites, the honored saints, for instance? Would that not be something that contributed to the good of society? From this idea that one could pay someone else, for instance, to go on penance, would it be better for me to go on a pilgrimage or for me to pay for 15 poor people to go on a pilgrimage. By this idea came about that one could get an indulgence, which was basically an act saying, I'm going to give this money so that something good can be done for the church, and by doing so, my confession is received and I return into a state of grace. Throughout one's life, they maintain in the state of grace through the sacramental system. And the sacramental system at this period had seven sacraments, beginning with baptism, leading into um, confirmation, in which one was supposed to confirm their faith after some brief education, the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist being one of the main activities by which one communed on the body and blood of Christ, according to the doctrine of transubstantiation, in which the priest is offering up once again the sacrifice of Christ that has led to the altar. This gives one grace and forgives one's sins. We also have such sacraments as marriage, holy orders, and um, at the end of life, last rites or holy unction. In this, one's entire life is tied up with the sacramental system of the church. Each person is going to sin, therefore they need the grace to be restored to them uh, by the church's sacramental system. At death, one is still not yet holy. How can the wretched sinner who has been trying to follow the word, follow God, but is still tainted by sin? How can they enter immediately into the presence of our Holy Father? Therefore, in the medieval church, and dating slightly earlier in some accounts, developed this doctrine of purgatory. This was an intermediate state after life in which one, in some ways, paid off or was purged of their sin. All unconfessed sin and unfinished penance were removed. One who was in purgatory was on their way to heaven to be with God. However, they were not yet prepared. So the doctrine of purgatory becomes very important, and people were very afraid of spending years, if not centuries, if not millennia, in purgatory, experiencing the punishment and purgation of their sins. This was a very um, real fear for many people, and not just for themselves, but for their relatives. So there developed in the Middle Ages the practice of um, paying for masses on behalf of those who have gone to purgatory. And recall, I said the Eucharist, or also called the Mass, was seen as a re-sacrifice of Christ on the altar by the priest, by his power to um, enact this sacrifice. And so masses were said so that the sins of those in purgatory could be washed away. Once this was done, one would enter into heaven, awaiting the resurrection of the dead. And so in this, the sacramental system, the act of mediation by the priests and penance would deeply mark all of medieval spiritual life. It's into this context that we see Luther coming into the equation. And so I want to briefly talk about Luther's life before we look at how he rejected the system. Luther was born in 1483 to a mildly prosperous German family. His father was actually the supervisor of a mine. And his father wanted him to go into law, which was kind of a still standard practice by many um, middle class people today. However, Luther would, be, would disappoint his father in 1505 when he entered into an Augustinian monastery, becoming an Augustinian friar. This was because uh, he'd been traveling through a forest during a quite frightening thunderstorm, and he made a vow to St. Anne 
to, if she got him through this, if she would offer prayers to God on his behalf, he would join a monastery. He was rescued from the storm and, true to his vow, joined the Augustinian order. Shortly thereafter, his superior sent him to the rather new University of Wittenberg, where Luther would take several doctorates in theology and would later become a professor. During his time as a monk, Luther was very troubled over his sins and continually, in some ways, pestered his confessor with the sins that he had not fully confessed. Um, he would come to the confessor multiple times a day, a man named Staupitz, um, who advised him to read the scriptures and to uh, dig much further into his understanding of the Bible. But in this, Luther could find no rest. He could never be sure that he had confessed enough. He could never be sure that he was living as he ought to. This is partially because at the time, Luther believed that one is saved if they do what is in them. This was an idea that developed in the late Middle Ages in a school called nominalism. That what God expects from us is not holiness, but the best we can possibly do. And so, if you did your best, trying to follow God, trying to follow his law, trying to follow the, sac uh, the sacramental system, trying to pursue him, God would accept your best as that which could bring you into salvation. The rest would be made up by Christ and the intercession of the saints, who had a superabundance of merit that they could give to you. And in this, though, there's always the question, have I done enough? Have I done my best? How can I know I've done my best? What um, Am I going to end up in purgatory indefinitely for my unconfessed sin, my unrepentant heart? And so Luther said later in his life that, Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. So Luther in this time goes through a crisis of conscience. And turning to the scripture, he will come to see the grace of God covering his failings and that this attempt to earn salvation, to please God by doing what we could do, was never going to be enough, but it was only through faith in Christ. He comes to this idea before, um, in, his, in the early 1520s, it's hard to say exactly, but what sparks this idea um, and what brings it to public knowledge is a controversy that Luther gets in over the practice of indulg indulgences. And this brings us back to Leo X's attempt to raise money for St. Peter's Basilica. So around the around 1516, 1517, a man travels near Wittenberg, a man named Johann Tetzel, and begins selling indulgences to the people of the town. Luther becomes quite upset with this practice because he feels like it is taking advantage of the poor. So Tetzel is a great salesman. He even has a great advertising slogan, which is come down to us as, as soon as the coin in a coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. So just imagine this. You are a German peasant. You loved your wife, your child, your grandmother very deeply. However, you know she wasn't perfect. She sometimes got angry with you. She might yell. She might curse occasionally. Um, she could be an angry woman. And so you know that she's in purgatory, suffering um, quite horrendously. You know she'll go to heaven eventually, but she's got a long road before her of pain. And a man comes to town and says, if you pay this money, your granny, your child, your spouse uh, can be spared this punishment, this great torment and purgation. If you do this, your yourself or your loved one will be closer to God's love and salvation. Now, you're a peasant. You know that God is real. You accept that without question. And you know that you're a sinner. And what's more important with your money, that you have a little more food next week or the salvation of your soul? And so in this, Tetzel was able to raise a lot of money, mostly from the people who could use it the most. This angered Luther very deeply. He saw Tetzel as a charlatan. And in some ways, Tetzel was a charlatan even amongst the sellers of indulgences with his exploitative practices. Seeing this, Luther decides to protest. He decides that he is going to offer public debate over the nature of indulgences. And this happens on October 31st, 1517, when Luther nails the 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church. Now, 
It is actually unclear whether or not Luther nailed uh, the 95 Theses to the door. This becomes the symbolic um, act that sparks the Reformation. And even if he did, um, which I, I think he did, um, it wasn't really this dramatic act. The door of the local church was actually the town message board. And so by posting these 95 Theses, he was actually inviting all and sundry to come to a public debate over the practice of indulgences. Okay. Luther's intention here was not to break away from the church, but he sought to, through public argumentation, to demonstrate the falsehood of the practice of indulgences and to reform the practice of the church in the many ways we've seen before. But in these, he also criticizes the power of the Pope to issue indulgences itself. Right? If indulgences are wrong, Pope Leo is wrong to be building St. Peter's Basilica through their proceeds. And that leads him also to rejecting the wealth of the church. The church was meant to be um, for the poor, caring for the needy, the sick, the widow, and the orphan. And especially the Renaissance popes had been creating palaces for themselves, living in fine homes, and living a rather luxurious life. All these things Luther comes to reject and challenge in the 95 Theses. This will spark a controversy that will rage across Europe quite quickly after these are posted. They are printed up and sent throughout the land. And this makes Luther almost an immediate celebrity. He is pushing back against the corruption of the church, and all those who've been waiting for something like this see and take notice. After the initial controversy over indulgences, Luther expands his attack on the current state of the church through various writings. He attacks papal authority beyond the use of indulgences more openly in a work called The Babylonian Captivity of the Church, calling the papacy a sham and ultimately the work of the Antichrist. He attacks the practice of the seven sacraments, arguing that there are only two, the Lord's Supper and baptism, and Luther leaves confession as maybe a half sacrament, although it does not have to be uh, from a priest and it does not affect the forgiveness of sins, it merely is a useful practice for him. So he rejects the seven sacraments and the kind of economy of grace that we see working in the medieval church, that they mediate salvation. Luther rejects the entire mediation of salvation by the church. Rather, salvation comes by Christ, who is the sole mediator. What is going on with the clergy is not the act of a priest, one who mediates between God and man, but merely that of a pastor, one who proclaims the word of God and the forgiveness that is found in Christ. And in this, he also rejects human cooperation and salvation. This comes about quite famously in a debate that he has with the humanist scholar Erasmus, in which Luther argues that the human will is bound by sin. Because of original sin, we cannot choose God. There is nothing good within us. If we are left in our state, we will always reject God. What we must rely on is the grace of God to redeem our hearts, to regenerate us, to give us faith so that we might see him, that we might become righteous because Christ is righteous and not some sort of act in ourselves, not a view of salvation in which we do our part and the church does it. Now, Erasmus also was a Catholic reformer who rejected this kind of crass understanding of econ almost an economy of salvation in the medieval church. But he still argued that our wills were not so damaged that we could not choose God, that there was something still naturally good about us. And Luther rejected this, even if the act of the human being is just to will for God to save them. It is still based on the human effort and not the divine willing that brings salvation. So, in the several years after the nailing of the 95 Theses, Luther's theology uh, develops very quickly and becomes much more controversial by each of his writings. And to understand why Luther thought this, we need to go back to his fundamental question, which is how can we, sinful, fallen, finite human beings, stand before a holy and righteous God? Luther, in his days as a monk, was very fearful of God. How could he stand before his holiness? How could he possibly claim um, fellowship with an utterly righteous God, knowing his own sin and failings? And because of this, he was very afraid of even parts of the Bible. For instance, a verse that haunted Luther was Romans 1.17, For in the gospel the righteousness of God is revealed. 
For Luther, this was not good news. The gospel here seemed to reveal his own damnation. For if God is utterly righteous, and this is what we see in the gospel of Jesus Christ, how is it that a sinner can stand? How can we possibly say that our best is good enough for the holy, righteous God? And it's actually in this verse that Luther makes the term, what he sees as the fundamental shift in his theology. Um, and he says that there, in this passage, Romans 1, 16 and 17, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness with which merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. So what Luther is saying here is he's taking this verse to mean that in the gospel, what is revealed is God's righteousness that he gives to us in Jesus Christ. That because Christ is wholly righteous, that he has died for our sins, the unjust, uh, the just in the place of the unjust sinner, there we can receive our righteousness. We can be joined to Christ. We can, by faith, walk and live in a righteousness not our own. And for this, Luther coins the phrase alien righteousness, and the righteousness that is foreign to us. The righteousness by which we are justified, according to Luther, does not come from our own effort, our own merit, or the mediation of the church, but purely from faith in Christ, and that righteousness being imputed or reckoned to us because of his work on the cross. Therefore, for Luther, faith is the central aspect to the gospel. In fact, he says that the doctrine of justification by faith alone is the, the position on which the church stands or falls. Faith for Luther is utter trust in Christ for our salvation. It is created by and is receiving the gospel of Christ. That means that Luther doesn't see even faith as some sort of work that humans drudge up within themselves. Faith is rather that which God himself has granted us. He has reformed that broken, fallen, bounded will, and he's made it free. Free not to sin, but free in Christ to trust him to love him. Therefore, faith defines all of the Christian's relationship to God, an utter trust on his mercy, a trust on the finished work of Christ. It is by faith that the Christian is righteous and free, and it is this faith that unites us to Christ, who grants us his holy status as the Son of God. Luther says, faith alone can fulfill the law and justify without works, not by doing the works of the law, but by believing to we glorify God and acknowledge that he is truthful. So for Luther, faith is trusting in God's promise that in Christ we have been made new, that in Christ we have died to sin, that in Christ we have been raised to new life, and that everything we do from there is for and through and to Christ. So this is Luther's gospel, that we are justified not by our own works, not by our own effort, not even a little bit, not even the act of choosing God, but we are justified or declared righteous before God purely by his grace and our faith that Christ has paid it all and will bring us into salvation. For these ideas, Luther is excommunicated by Pope Leo X in 1520. He uh, issues a bull, uh, ex urge domine, which means uh, to be cast out by God. And this claims that Luther, the wild boar, was destroying the church. He saw Luther's ideas as a deep attack on the very essence of Catholic Christianity at the time. Luther is rejecting the authority of the Pope. He's rejecting the entire um, system of sacramentology. He's rejecting purgatory. He's rejecting the need of merit and works. And in this, uh, the Pope sees a radical, someone who is going to destabilize society. For, he will say, if we are made righteous not by our works or effort, but purely by the grace of Christ, will this not lead to anarchy? Will this not lead to people doing whatever is right in their own eyes and saying, I've been forgiven? Will this not destabilize the power and significance of the church and leave it open to the, the power of the secular rulers? In consort with Pope Leo X, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who had recently been elected to the throne, passed measures to su suppress all of Luther's writing, and summons Luther in 1521 to the Diet of Worms, um, where the Emperor expects him to recant. However, Luther refuses. 
Charles V, who at the time has yet to really assume the authority of the imperial throne, he's still working it out, the, the Holy Roman Empire, um, has a very tenuous relationship between em emperor and princes. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. He lines up Luther's books on the table and asks him to recant these heretical notions, specifically his rejection of the papacy, his notion that salvation comes by faith alone, and his idea that you can only prove a theological truth from scripture. Luther asks to be given time, and he spends the night in prayer and comes back the next day and makes a rather famous, um, rather famous declaration. He tells the uh, he tells the emperor as well as all the assembled dignitaries, that unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in the councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the scriptures. I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot, and I will not retract anything, since it is neither safe nor right to go against your conscience. With this, the humble monk from Wittenberg, the university professor, um, is standing in, um, in contempt of both the most powerful secular ruler of Europe, Charles V, and the Bishop of Rome, the head of the entire Catholic religion in Europe. This is a very bold step, but Luther sees this as itself an act of faith trusting that the scriptures are true, and trusting that he, he should never go against them if he is convinced that this is correct. In this, Luther, in some ways, lands a fatal blow to um, the ideas and powers of the Pope and to, um, and to the Emperor. But he has to live in order for that to matter. Luckily, uh, Luther had gone to the council with the insurance of free passage assured by the Duke of Saxony, Frederick the Wise, um, who was in control of the area where Wittenberg was made. This was done partially, actually, in response to what happened to Jan Hus. Jan Hus had gone to the Council of Constance to explain his views, and he was actually assured safe passage. And when he was there, his views were condemned and he was burned as a heretic. However, Luther's protection uh, holds up and he is able to leave safely. This is an important point we need to understand about the Reformation. It wasn't just a night, it wasn't just a practice of ideas. If Luther had not been able to sway many very influential princes within Germany, the Reformation would be snuffed out very quickly. So there is a unity of religious power of the reformers and the protective power of the princes in Germany and the cities in Switzerland that allow the safe space for the Reformation to come about. So after the Diet of Worms, Luther is in fact kidnapped by men of the Elector Frederick and taken to the Wartburg Castle. He is kidnapped in order for his own safety. Uh, he has been excommunicated and he could be put to death any moment. So Luther stays in the Wartburg Castle. He grows a beard, as you can see in the famous um, painting above. He takes the title Juner Jörg and he begins to write. Luther decides that what he must do is translate the Bible into German so that it can be received by the people. He uses a text actually produced by Erasmus, who had recently, um, in the, fifth, uh, the 15 teens, produced a new edition of the Greek New Testament. And Luther moves from this in order to produce the German Bible, which will be one of the most influential works uh, for the foundation of modern German. Luther returns to Wittenberg and deals with some of the issues that have been going on there. One of the other most important events in this later part of his life is his marrying uh, Katharina von Bohr, or Katie Luther. Um, Katie actually was a former nun, and Luther had been contacted in Wittenberg uh, in order to get 12 nuns out of this monastery. He actually sneaks them out in barrels of fish. After marrying off many of these nuns, because he also rejected the medieval practice of clerical celibacy, um, Katharina would not go with any of the men he suggested. He tried two different men to um, have Katerina marry, and she decided she didn't like them. She ultimately says that she would marry Luther. Uh, Luther was initially um, skeptical of this, not because of his feelings about Katie, but because he assumed he would be dead in any moment. Seeing, though, that he should fulfill the Reformation and cast off the false vow of celibacy he had taken, he does marry Catherine, and they have a rather uh, interesting and lovely marriage. He called uh, Katie often his rib, referring back to 
the Garden of Adam and Eve, where Eve is made out of Adam's rib. So they have a very touching relationship. There are many other significant events in Luther's life, and I will turn to some of them later in this lecture. But one that we should see is in 1530, he once again appears before the emperor. And here at the um, Diet of Augsburg, he presents the Augsburg Confession, which is a confession of the Lutheran faith, which will be the foundation for all Lutheranism from there on out. There's much more that could be said about Luther's life and his writings. He will live into the 1540s and will be the most significant influence by far on the branch of Christianity that we know today as Lutheranism. I do want to focus on two aspects of his theology that are utterly foundational for the Reformation and then see how he modifies the medieval view of salvation. The first and maybe most important Ah, it's hard to say, they're both so important. Uh, doctrine that Luther comes up with is that of sola scriptura, that the Bible alone is the final authority for life and doctrine. And therefore he rejects um, tradition as a source of theology. It is not as if the truth of God comes through two ways, one through the written Bible and one through an unwritten tradition that is passed down in the Roman Catholic Church. This is one of the most fundamental differences between the Protestants and the Catholics, with Protestants saying that it is only by Scripture alone that the final truth of theology can be decided, and that church authority, church tradition, um, the acts of the theologians, the works of the fathers, the ideas of councils, are all subordinate to the Word of God. Now, that doesn't mean that one doesn't use these other ideas or sources to develop our theological ideas, to uh, think through the implications of the Bible. But we accept them not because of their unique authority. For instance, um, Protestants do not accept the church councils because they are church councils, but because the church councils rendered the truth according to the word of God. And they can be extremely helpful, extremely illuminating to us, but it is not their authority itself, but the truth speaking through them that is confirmed by the scriptures. So this is Luther's first major innovation that will shape the rest of Protestant history. The second is what we've discussed before, the idea that we are justified by grace alone through faith alone. So this rejects any view of salvation that is based on a combination of faith and human effort. Salvation is wholly based on the grace of God. We are trapped in our sin. We have committed... Um, We've committed many sins in our lives, and even more than that, we have the stain of original sin. Our wills are bonded. We cannot choose God. Our sin just drives us away from him and into despair. And it's only by God's grace, his unmerited favor, his act to change us, to grant us faith, to redeem us, that we can be justified. And the instrument of that justification is not works, but it is the faith itself. So faith in Christ's work is the only means of salvation. And this is given to a believer, not by their own acts, not by their own will, but purely by the grace of God changing them, acting within them. We see in this a return to the full Augustinian position of salvation that accords no uh, contribution of humanity to their own salvation, but purely and completely resting upon the grace of God. And from this, we can see how Luther's theology radically modifies medieval views of salvation. So, he still has the same view of sin. Humanity is born into original sin, and he actually retains more or less the Roman Catholic view of baptism, such that by baptism, the stain of original sin is washed away. That is maintained in the most branches of Lutheranism to this day. Once one is baptized, though, one must have faith. Faith, then, which is a gift of God by his grace, leads us into the state of justification. Not of grace, but of justification. We are declared righteous before God purely by the work of Christ that has been imputed or reckoned to us by our faith that is a product of God's own acts. Yet we still sin. However, sin does not drop us out of a state of justification. I ask your forgiveness that I couldn't reflect this purely in modifying this diagram. But we sin, but we do not fall out of justification. We are still justified. We are, as Luther says, both simultaneously saint and sinner. We sin, and therefore we repent to God. In fact, the first of the 95 Theses is that the whole of Christian life is an act of repentance. We repent, but we do not require 
a priest any longer to give absolution. Luther thought it might be a good idea to confess to a pastor, but it is not necessary for the process. God will hear us, and we can repent purely through Christ and receive forgiveness. And so, once one has faith for Luther, one is justified. And even though we sin, this does not take away our justification before God, and they must live a life of repentance. Because of these ideas, of course, Luther rejects any idea of purgatory. One does not go into the holy presence of God because of their own holiness, but they are made holy by the act of Christ, giving them his justifying righteousness. And at death, they are purged of all their final sins in a moment and enter immediately into the presence of the holy God. So we see in this how radical Luther's view must have been to those in the Catholic Church of the time. He has rejected the entire system of penance. He has rejected the usefulness of a priest in order to bring about salvation. He has rejected the entire system of purgatory. And he is focused much more on faith, the reading of the Bible, and the simple practice of Christian worship. These things will lead to uh, drastic changes throughout Europe and will spark many more reformations. So, having established Luther's thought, let us move on to look at other reformations, specifically the reformation of the Swiss churches in Switzerland. So we're going to look at the Swiss Reformation before briefly detouring into uh, the Anabaptists. We'll look at Zwingli, the reformer of Zurich, John Calvin, the reformer of Geneva, and the reform tradition more broadly that is based on the teachings of these two men. But before getting into that, we do also need to note that there are other reformations going on. In fact, in some ways, calling this period the Reformation is misleading. In some ways, the 16th century is the era of reformations. With uh, Luther cracking the door open for reform, it quickly gets out of hand. With both the main traditions we can think of, such as the Lutherans, the Reformed, um, the English Reformation that will become Anglicanism, and even sparking a reform within the Catholic Church itself, which we will look at next time. There were also more radical groups that now being able to go to the Bible alone can come up with all sorts of ideas. And one of these groups is generally titled the Anabaptists. These were Christians who denied the validity of infant baptism, for they saw no uh, justification for it in Scripture, and therefore they were rebaptized. This is what Anna means those who have been baptized again. Uh, these groups could range from very calm and passive uh, to very radical. For instance, many of these Anabaptists were influential in uh, kind of rabble-rousing for what was known as the Peasants' War, which was a, um, a peasants' revolt that took place in Germany with very, very uh, tragic results. But also, some of these reformers even took over the city of Munster, and instituted a utopia, claiming that the New Jerusalem had come, and they suspended normal Christian morality, engaging in polygamy and several other um, unsavory events. In, in fact, in order to bring down what is called the Munster Revolt, both Catholic and Protestant armies joined together to bring an end to it. So the Anabaptists, by rejecting baptism, by rejecting the state, were seen as extremely volatile, for the church, and they were persecuted by all sides. Uh, this is not a pleasant thing, but it is something that occurred, and it, it was very unfortunate. Uh, but you have to understand what was happening at the time. To reject the church is to reject the state in this period. So heresy in the 16th century is not just an ecclesial offense. It is also an act of treason against the ruler. And so this was a very uh, difficult time. These Anabaptists in general uh, focused on a very individual interpretation of the Bible. While Luther himself held to Sola Scriptura, he thought that this must be done in conversation with the history of the church. Um, one cannot just come up with whatever interpretation seems to suit their fancy. As I said, they believe in believer's baptism. In this are the roots of what we now call the Baptist traditions, although they developed later in England. There's also a focus on the communal nature of the church, returning to early church practices of communal living, of the rejection of private property, and sharing all things in common. And this led them to separate out from the world. Most Anabaptists rejected the ability of Christians to be civil magistrates, for instance, or to participate in the larger world. So this is very much a view that is 
uh, discussed in modern discussions as Christ against culture. To properly live as Christians, we must separate ourselves fully from the world. That's why many of these groups would form uh, unique separate communities from the rest of society. Most Anabaptist traditions also focused on synergy. So this is a return to the idea that the act of salvation is a unified effort between God and the human will. Okay. And because of this, they, off, they very much emphasize discipleship and devotion, especially trying to fulfill very clearly and fully the commands of Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. And so they thought that the human will was capable of doing this and therefore could be brought into salvation by a combined act of God's will and their own. After the debacle at Munster with the revolt, um, the, many of these groups became and embraced uh, a form of pacifism. Uh, primarily led by the man above me, Minnow Simons, who would bring them into a um, much more healthy era. And out of these groups come such figures as the Mennonites, the Amish, and the Hutterites. So these radical reformers had much going, uh, going on in the 16th century, and they have persisted to this day. But they were more on the side from several of what we call the magisterial reformers, the Lutheran and the Reformed. So, having just briefly mentioned the radical reformers, I'd like to move on to the main reformer in Switzerland at the time of Luther, Ulrich Zwingli. He was the kind of preeminent reformer in Switzerland. There, there were others, such as a man named Johannes Oecolampadius and um, others. And he's probably best understood as the earliest reformed theologian. So, he has a different take than Luther, some different emphases, and a different background. In 1519, uh, Zwingli becomes the main preacher in Zurich, one of the major cities in the Swiss Confederation, and it is there that he leads his own reformation until his death in 1531. It's actually unclear how much Zwingli is influenced by Luther. We know that Zwingli read Luther, and many of his ideas are similar, especially in broad strokes, but Zwingli himself claims that he came to his ideas of Reformation by reading the Greek New Testament by himself. And this happened when he was a parish priest. Zwingli was from Switzerland and was trained in both humanism and scholastic theology uh, at both the universities of Vienna and later Basel. And from there, after attaining a Master of Arts, he went and became a parish priest at two small towns in Switzerland, where he spent over 10 years. While there, he continued his study of humanistic and the, uh, scholastic theology, and was one of the first people to receive the Greek New Testament as translated by Erasmus. Swingley had taught himself Greek and Hebrew, uh, began in university but continued in his time as a pastor, and read the Greek New Testament many times. It's, he claims that it was through this study that he arrived at his understanding of justification by faith alone, the reliance on God's grace, and the focus on the purity of religion. Zwingli's main idea is that only God deserves to be worshipped in all things, and Christ is the only mediator between God and humanity, and this is because he is both God and man. Therefore, anything else that we ascribe worship to, that we ascribe honor to, anything we put between us and God other than Christ is false and leads to false worship and idolatry. Therefore, this more radical view of uh, of the rejection of all idolatry under the authority of Scripture leads Zwingli to reject the Mass, reject religious images, especially images of Christ, and much medieval ceremony and ritual, including even musical instruments in worship. Zwingli thought all of these things interfered, ran interference between the human and God, and there was the only one thing that stood us between, between us and the Holy God, and that is Christ. So we can describe the different emphases of Luther and Zwingli by different questions. For Luther, the question is very much, how can I find a merciful God? Luther finds the answer to this in his doctrine of justification by faith alone. While Zwingli asks in some ways a broader question, where can I find the true and pure church of God? Well, he agrees with Luther completely about the need of justification by faith, of God's grace, of the su sufficiency and supremacy of scripture alone. He wants to see the Reformation go further. You see, Luther kind of let those things that were not pertinent, as far as he could tell, to the doctrine of salvation slide. Luther did not institute a radical reform of the Christian life or of the liturgy. Zwingli takes this much further and says that all of Christian existence must be brought under the will of God. 
Everything that is against um, God's holy will must be removed so that we can live purely before God. This leads to a rather rough conflict between these two figures over specifically the doctrine of the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist. So I want to turn and discuss this because this event leads ultimately to the separation of the Lutheran and Reformed branches of the church. And this is generally known as the Eucharistic controversy, which waged between Luther and Zwingli and many other, uh, many other figures um, from 1524 until 1529 at least. This debate began in 1524 when one of Luther's uh, compatriots in Wittenberg rejected the presence of Christ in the Eucharistic elements, a man named Karlstadt. While very few people would follow Karlstadt's teaching um, on an interpretation of the words, this is my body, it did open up the floodgates for a variety of discussions going on, with hundreds of texts over this period flying back and forth from Catholic, Lutheran, and Reformed figures. However, the main and most important participants in this debate were Luther and Zwingli themselves. And the key to all of this was how does one interpret Christ's words at the Last Supper? This is my body. You see, in the medieval period, these are interpreted as saying that the bread and the wine become truly and really the body and blood of Christ after the priest says over the elements, hoc es corpus meum, or this is my body. This actually, that phrase is actually where the term hocus pocus comes from. It was seen by the priest uttering these words, by the power of his ordination, the elements are transformed. What were once bread and wine now are the body and blood of the risen and ascended Christ. So, while they still see the, seem the same, while they still feel like bread, taste like bread, smell like wine, taste like wine, they are in fact nothing of the sort. What has remained is their accidents, those qualities of a thing that can change, its sight, taste, feel, place, all those things that are not essential to its nature. However, its essence has been changed. Its substance has undergone transformation. So what was once the substance of bread with the normal experience of bread has now been transformed to the substance of Christ's body and the experience of bread. And in this, we have transubstantiation. The substance of the bread and wine has been transformed into the very body and blood of Christ. And this is understood as a miracle. And it's because of this that the medieval Catholic Church and the Catholic Church till today see the act of Eucharist as a reinstitution of the sacrifice of Christ because it is truly the body and blood of Christ. Christ that is being offered by the priest to the Father for the forgiveness of human sins that the people then eat of and receive the grace of God. Luther rejects this, but not for the reasons you might think. And Zwingli also rejects this. But they both need to then come up with their own interpretations of the phrase, this is my body. So this leads to a growing division between the Swiss and the Lutheran wings of the Reformation. And to add complications to this, the political situation of the Reformation is becoming quite tenu tenuous at this time. So let's go back and look at what was going on with the political situation behind the Eucharistic debate. With this growing division, one Protestant prince, Philip of Hesse, sought to mediate between the two sides, and he enlisted some of the other princes as well. Philip called for a pan-Protestant alliance against the Catholic princes. Because at this time, the Holy Roman Empire was divided between those princes who supported the Reformation and shielded the preachers, and those who rejected it and wanted to continue to exercise the, the verdict of the Edict of Worms, in which Luther was excommunicated and his writings should be burned. Philip feared that the emperor would lead a military campaign against the Protestants and squash the Reformation by military means. And as this debate is brewing between Luther and Zwingli, the tide turns even more against the Protestant princes. This comes about in an event called the Second Diet of Spire from March to April 1529. In this, the Protestant position in the empire was weakened because the Diet of Spire reaffirmed the Edict of Worms that Luther ought to be excommunicated and all that follow him are heretical and all their writings should be burned and condemned within the empire. So the majority of the Diet of Spire affirm this, and there is then a protest leveled by the Protestant princes to this act. It is, in fact, here that the name Protestant arises, as these Protestant princes protest the um, affirmation of the Edict of Worms. 
This was becoming more prominent because Charles V, if you recall him from the Diet of Worms, was gaining in power. For much of his early reign as the Holy Roman Empire Emperor, he was not able to consolidate his power. You see, Charles was not just the Holy Roman Emperor. He was the King of Spain as well, and therefore controlled the Netherlands, and southern Italy, and all of Austria. He was a member of what was known as the Habsburg Dynasty, the uh, the man who owned and controlled more land in Europe than anyone at that period, um, and probably any king since the time of Charlemagne. So if he could muster his forces and focus on the Holy Roman Empire, which he only had um, kind of titular control of for most of this period, then problems would assure for the Protestants because he was very firm against them. Leading up to 1529, Charles had just made peace with his two main rivals, the King of France and the Papacy. And with this, not having to worry about his holdings in Spain and Italy, he turned his attention fully to the problems in the Holy Roman Empire. And this map shows us the situation that the Protestants were in. Everything in green was controlled by Charles V. And you notice he has hemmed the Protestants in on every side, with Wittenberg being here and the Swiss here. They were worried that the emperor could come in with overwhelming force and destroy the Protestant movement. So Philip of Hesse sought to bring the reformers together by getting them to agree on the Eucharist. He especially wanted the Swiss, because um, the Swiss are a very mountainous people. They don't have much to export, so what they've been exporting for the last several centuries was mercenaries. There were no more fierce fighters in Europe in the time than the Swiss. And so Philip wanted to see a, a, uni a united front between the German Protestants and the Swiss Protestants, because then they might stand a chance if the emperor decided to take them down by military means. However, what stood in the way was the little phrase, this is my body. So what Philip does is he, through months and months of negotiation, gets representatives of the Swiss and the Lutherans to come together at the castle of Marburg in what is called the Marburg Colloquy of 1529. This occurs over four days. There are several sessions of debate, both in the morning and the afternoon, and Philip presides over the discussion. The main points of the agenda were the nature of Christ's presence in the Eucharist, and therefore to lead to Protestant unity. At this colloquy, Luther and Zwingli are the main proponents for their various sides. So I want to begin on the places where Luther and Zwingli agree. Both Luther and Zwingli reject the doctrine of transubstantiation, that the bread and the wine cease to be bread and wine, but become the body and blood of Christ in a real corporeal manner. However, they do so for different reasons. Luther rejects the doctrine of transubstantiation not so much because of the presence of Christ's body and blood, which he actually affirms, but because the bread and the wine are absent. So we'll see why that is in a second. They both reject the Mass as a sacrifice. As I've said, the practice of uh, the Church in the Middle Ages was the bread and the wine become truly, really, substantially the body and blood of Christ. They are then offered at the altar by the priest to God for the sins of the people standing behind them. And therefore, sins that were not forgiven at the beginning of the Mass are now forgiven by the end because of this representation of the sacrifice of Christ. And both Luther and Zwingli reject that, resting purely on the finished work of Christ's sacrifice on the cross that is applied by faith. So they both reject the Mass as a sacrifice. They also both reject the idea of communion in one kind. As we talked about before, the laity were not given the cup or the wine to drink. Both of them reject that following after the lead of Jan Hus. And another thing, they both agree that the Lord's Supper is an instrumental and completely and very significant part of the Christian life. Their debate over the Lord's Supper was not something trivial to them. For both representatives, Luther and Zwingli, what was at stake in the Lord's Supper was the gospel itself. How are we going to understand Christ? How are we going to obey his words? Where can we meet him? Where can we be united with him? And so both of them saw this as a very central gospel issue of how is Christ present in this Eucharist? How are we to understand our Lord's words that this is my body? So this is where they agree. They reject transubstantiation. They reject the masses of sacrifice. They reject the lady only receiving the, the bread and not the cup. And they agree that this is a very important discussion. However, they disagree on two very important points. They disagree exactly how are the bread and wine on the table related to the body and blood of Jesus himself. How is it that this bread and wine relate to the real resurrected Lord? 
as he reigns over this world. And they disagree over exactly what sort of benefits one receives from partaking of the elements and how they are received. This is a rather intricate debate, but I want to give us a brief sni uh, snippet of how each of them interpret the words, this is my body, and what this means for their understanding of the Lord's Supper. This is important because, as I've said, it's at this event when they fail to come to an agreement that results in this, the definitive split between the Lutheran and the Reformed camps of the Reformation. And I want to, to let you know what was at stake here for them. So, Luther's position. Luther holds that the phrase, this is my body, does not need to be interpreted. It comes with the interpretation of Christ built in. When Christ says, this is my body, it is his body. Therefore, for Luther, the Christ is bodily present under the bread and the wine, which continue to be present. So the difference between Luther's view and that of the Roman Catholic Church at this time is not that the body and blood of Christ are there on the altar or on the table. It is that the bread and the wine are not there in the Catholic view. Luther says, no, there is no trans transubstantiation. The substance of the bread and the wine remain. However, the substance of Christ's body comes under the bread and the wine. And so one can partake of it and participate in Christ. This was his real goal. He wants to obey the words of Christ. He says these don't need to be interpreted. The Spirit himself gives us this interpretation. And how dare Zwingli, he says, go against the words of Christ. Therefore, Luther says we must by faith accept that the, word, that the body and blood of Christ are there. However they are there, he doesn't really care. But he does propose this view, they are under the elements. And this is very important. For Luther, this is made possible, because you might wonder, Christ has a true human body. Think back to all of our discussions of Christology, Christ is fully God and fully man. You have a human body, right? You know that it can't be in multiple places at once. It's this fleshy stuff only exists in one place at one time. That's what it means to be human, That's what it means to be finite. Luther argues, however, that by the fact that Christ is united, in that he's fully God and fully man united in one person. The Christ glorified body, his body after the, the resurrection and the ascension into heaven, becomes omnipresent because of its, un, its union with the omnipresent divine nature. This is called the doctrine of ubiquity, the ubiquity of Christ's human body. Luther argues that because Christ is joined, Christ's person has joined his divine nature, which is omnipresent, with his human nature, his human nature can now be, be omnipresent, be present anywhere that it is possible to be. And so in this, he grounds um, his understanding of the Lord's Supper, that Christ is bodily present under the elements. Later Lutheran tradition will add the phrases, in, with, and under the elements. Zwingli has a very different idea. For Zwingli, Following after his humanistic training, which focuses very much on the careful interpretation of language, this is my body should be interpreted figuratively, meaning this signifies my body. So for Zwingli, the bread and the wine are signs that point to the reality that they're supposed to embody, which is the body and blood of Christ slain for the believer. Zwingli understands the phrase, this is my body, much as one would understand the phrase, Christ is the vine, or Christ is the door, or Christ is the narrow way, for instance. This is a metaphor. This is a trope. When Christ breaks the bread and pours the wine at the Last Supper, he is not giving to the people there his concrete flesh and blood. He is giving to them a sign of his coming death. So for Zwingli, at this period, the Supper is a commemoration of Christ's death and an act of confession of the Church that they believe in his death for salvation and an act of thanksgiving by the Church for this great salvation. So that's even what the term Eucharist means, the giving of thanks. So Zwingli believes that the Supper is much more our act in which we give back to God what he has. This is our commemorating his death. Think of, do this in remembrance of me. It's confessing our faith in his death, and it's giving thanks for his death. Now, Zwingli will, uh, in some of his later writings, shift a little bit on this and have more of an idea of a spiritual presence, uh, which Calvin will later hold. Uh, but at Marburg, his view is much more of that of commemoration. And Zwingli holds this partially because of how Luther supports his position. So we remember that Luther supports his position and reading of this is my body because of the omnipresence of Christ's human nature. 
Zwingli argues that Christ cannot be bodily present in the elements because his body is a true human body, which can only be in one place. After the ascension, Christ's body is in heaven, and therefore he cannot be simultaneously in heaven and at all the Eucharistic tables throughout the world. That would be to make his body not a real body. At Marburg, Zwingli rejects Luther's claims that the body of Christ can be everywhere, saying that Christ's body, because it is a human body joined with the divine nature, is not everywhere. Christ is everywhere, the person who is divine and human. And we have access to his humanity through the divinity and through his spirit. It's not as if we're distant from the one who was incarnate. Christ is near us, for us, in us, all these things. Um, but his body is not in us. His body is in heaven. And we await his, his coming again bodily at the end of time, not at the Lord's Supper. So Zwingli is rejecting this idea that Christ can be bodily present on, on the Eucharistic altar because of this doctrine of ubiquity that Luther sets forward. So this is the main division. Let's look at the outcome of Marburg. Ultimately, as I'm sure you could surmise by this point, Luther and Zwingli do not agree on the presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. However, they do write a, uh, an act called the Articles of Marburg, and in this they agree on 14 and a half out of 15 points. The only sticking point is how is Christ present on the table. And I hope you see why this was surrounding very important issues for both these men. Um, and how would, what was at stake is how do we interpret scripture? Um, how do we understand Christ's presence with us? What is the nature of Christ's humanity itself? And how must we live our lives in light of this? Because of this, Philip of Hesse's plans for a pan-Protestant alliance will fail, and um, the debate will not be resolved. In fact, it is still a debate that hangs on today between the Lutheran and Reformed traditions over this nature of how Christ is present in the Eucharist. Calvin will bring it slightly closer in holding that Christ is spiritually present by the fact that the Holy Spirit raises up our hearts to partake of Christ as he is ascended in heaven, um, but this will not be enough for the Lutheran sides. Do you want to talk about the historical significance of this event and why we spent so much time on it? At Marburg, we see the definitive separation or the parting of ways in Protestantism. It's at this event that are solidified the two wings of the Protestant Reformation, the Lutheran and the Reformed. And this will have deep consequences in the later history of Europe. For instance, the Reformed tradition will remain illegal in the Holy Roman Empire. The Lutherans will gain legal acceptance and toleration in 1555. However, the, the Calvinist tradition or the Reformed tradition would not, and this will actually lead to some of the most brutal religious wars in European history, um, which occur when certain uh, princes in the Holy Roman Empire convert to the Reformed tradition, which is illegal and therefore invalidates their right to rule. This will lead especially to the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. Um, which will devastate uh, nearly a third of the population of Central Europe. So this event, this issue of theology, had very huge ramifications throughout history. And looking at Luther and Zwingli here, you have to, we have to see this as somewhat as a, of a tragedy. Um, both men were a little stubborn, Luther especially. Um, Luther refuses to really debate with Zwingli. He just time and time again cites this phrase, this is my body, refusing to come off that text. He does not listen to many of Zwingli's arguments or respond to them. Um, and in this, both men were doing the best they could. They were trying to be faithful to their conscience. Uh, neither of them bowed to the political necessities of the day. They thought this was a theological issue that could only be de decided by the interpretation of scripture. And in some ways, to their credit, they stayed true to their convictions. However, um, the implications for the later history of the church and of Europe would be quite devastated by this act. So quickly, um, Zwingli would not live much past the Marburg Colloquy. In fact, he would die in battle in October of 1531 uh, with Catholic forces. Uh, this is a complicated story. Uh, it's called the Second Ch uh, Chapel War. Basically, Switzerland is divided up into very different cantons. There's inner cantons that are more mountainous and external cantons that have more access to trade routes. Zurich is one of the external cantons. And there, after a first Chapel War, um, the Catholic forces thought that they had signed a treaty that no more Protestant preachers could come into their areas. 
Zwingli disagreed, continued to send these preachers who were arrested or driven out. Therefore, he, uh, Zurich, and many of the other confederation who were sympathetic to the Reformed uh, tradition began to blockade these inner uh, cantons, as they were called. This led to a war that Zurich was not prepared for, and Zwingli and many of the other citizens went out to meet this attack. Uh, Zwingli was to be killed in this battle and um, would send quite a few shockwaves through the Swiss tradition. However, the Reformation would continue in Switzerland, and it would continue in capable hands, one of those being the hands of John Calvin. There's a lot that could be said about John Calvin. Um, there are many, in some ways, myths, false impressions. There is probably no more divisive historical figure. Many people hate Calvin, calling him a tyrant, um, a cold, uh, calculating man, while many of those who have read his works see in him a deep heart of devotion for God, um, a deep fervor for truth, um, a lover of freedom. And in some ways, he's an enigmatic figure. And I, I don't think you really will find any person who uh, will elicit such drastically different responses from people. You'll still hear ideas that Calvin set up a theocracy in Geneva, that he was a dictator, um, that he was this rigid dogmatist. And I, I, I can't get into all these today, but uh, just know that Calvin was a very complicated figure and most of the popular understandings of his life and work are not true. Um, but at the same time, Calvin was not perfect. Um, his temperament could be cold at times. Um, he was slightly distant. And he did make some mistakes that um, he should be called out for, uh, especially the um, execution of Servetus, which is not necessarily his own fault, uh, but it is a blemish on his reputation as a reformer. Um, I'm not going to be able to get into that today, but if you want to know more, we can talk later. Let's briefly do Calvin's life and look at some of the points of Calvin's theology. So unlike Luther and Zwingli, Calvin is born in France, which gives it gives him a very different perspective on these issues. He was never an ordained clergy member, neither a monk nor a friar, but he was and he was never officially trained in theology either, like both Zwingli and Luther were. His formal training was in fact in law and humanism at both the universities of Paris and Orleans. Um, he was eventually forced to flee France after being uh, suspected of spreading Lutheran propaganda in 1533. Um, one of his friends gave a speech after becoming rector of part of the University of Paris that was in favor of reform, and his friend, uh, Cop and Calvin, uh, both had to flee Paris out of uh, their fear for uh, challenging the views of the church. Calvin was viewed as being a ghostwriter on this work. After fleeing Paris, Calvin sought out a life of study. What Calvin really wanted to do was be a humanist scholar. His first book, in fact, is a commentary on uh, the work of Seneca, an uh, ancient uh, Roman philosopher on clemency, which is said to be quite good and quite learned. Um, however, God would have other plans. As Calvin ex himself explains his goals here, he says, Being of a rather unsociable and shy disposition, I have always loved retirement and peace. So I began to look for some hideout where I could escape from people. My aim was always to live in private without being known. Well, um, the Lord certainly crossed Calvin's fair divine there, uh, fair design, and things would go very differently. Passing through Geneva in order to go to Strasbourg and find a place where he could go in solitude and do his work, uh, Calvin is press ganged by the very fiery um, minister, William Farrell. Uh, in July of 1531. Farrell uh, is a man of great passion. He, in fact, was a redhead, um, and he was not the most subtle of men. And so when this young scholar is passing through his town, and uh, Calvin had begin, begun to get a bit of a reputation, he'd spoken up in a couple disputations, his uh, initial draft of the Institutes of the Christian Religion had been published, and seeing this talent and this man who could be so useful for ministry, uh, Pharaoh basically tells Calvin, I call down a curse of God upon you if you leave this place um, and give up the ministry of the Reformation here. Calvin took him very seriously, and he stayed in Geneva. Calvin and Pharaoh's reform of Geneva was extremely rocky in its early years. They came into constant contact with members of the uh, 
the town with the town council and they wanted to bring a very radical reform quite quickly. Uh, this ultimately got on the nerves of the Geneva Council when they would not um, cede to the church the right of excommunication. Farrell and Calvin uh, decided to retort by refusing to serve communion at Easter in 1538. By so doing, the council basically said, you can do that, but you better be out of town the next day. So in 1538, both Calvin and Farrell are exiled um, from Geneva. Calvin spends the next three years in Strasbourg, where he intended to go all along, and there he was mentored by the Strasbourg reformer Martin Bucer, um, who is very significant in his own right. It's here that Calvin matures. Um, he becomes the pastor of the, the French church there and is able to, in some ways, move away from his youthful exuberance. You have to remember, Calvin um, is barely 30 at this point. In 1541, Calvin is invited back to Geneva. They thought they'd acted too rashly, and he is given the reins of the Reformation there. It should be noted that Farrell is not invited back. Calvin sought to reform both the theology and the morality of the city believing very firmly in the doctrine of justification by faith and the Bible alone, he, just as Luther did, he also had an impulse much more like Zwingli. This was going to be a complete reformation. All things that were contrary to the Bible in any sphere would have to be rooted out. And therefore, he formed what was known as the consistory, which was a council of 12 elders and 12 magistrates that oversaw the spiritual and moral life of Geneva to promote a godly society. Calvin's idea was that everything in the state of Geneva should be ordered around the word of God, and therefore what was necessary was church discipline. It is, in fact, this consistory uh, that has given Calvin such a bad name by some people claiming that this was some sort of tyrannical rule over the city. It could, it could be nothing further from the, the truth. Um, the town council still ruled in all political matters. The consistory was an area of ecclesiastical discipline, which in this period that did bleed over into what we would consider uh, in our modern Western context, um, much more private matters. The consistory uh, did not haul people before them in any sort of inquisitive manner, but this was uh, more or less as a session would act over a church if it's um, very involved with the people's lives and knows them. Um, and this was just happening for a city as a whole, who were all united in the same confession of faith. Much of the work that became came before the consistory was quite banal, um, and this has been shown more recently because the minutes of the consistory have been translated within the past 30 years. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, a mother brings two young boys before the consistory, so before Calvin and all these um, people of the city, and basically says they're not being nice to one another that these two brothers, are, there's like 10 and 8, um, and they're not showing proper Christian love to one another. And Calvin basically tells them, um, you're supposed to love your brother, we're going to have you back here in a couple weeks, and you want to tell us how um, how much you've grown in your love for your fellow, your fellow Christians. So I just find that funny. But there were many other things, as many other church um, discipline cases would deal with today, infidelity, cheating, lying, swearing. This would also be the, the body that was responsible for overseeing Christian education in the city. But what Geneva sought to be was a city on a hill to embody the fullness of the Christian gospel and the Christian message. And in this, they became a draw point for religious refugees from out from throughout the continent. Those who were inclined to the Reformation, who were being persecuted or hounded in their home country, would flock to Geneva, many of them from France, but also from various other corners of the world, from Italy, from Poland, etc. And even the English, well, the Scottish via England um, theologian and founder of Pro uh, Presbyterianism, John Knox, who we'll talk about more next time. Coming to Geneva, he said, Geneva is the most perfect school of Christ that ever was in this earth since the days of the apostles. In other places, I confess Christ to be truly preached, but manners and religion to be so sincerely reformed, I have not seen in any other place. So Geneva was seen as kind of the, the new beacon of the reformed tradition, carrying on those designs of Zwingli to see a full reformation of the church and true religion according to the word of God in all things. So moving beyond the activities within Geneva, Calvin's theology would be enshrined in a work called the Institutes of the Christian Religion, which he first wrote in 1536 as a small uh, brief summary 
of the Protestant faith in a catechetical form. Throughout his career, he would continue to rework this, and through five expanded editions, with the final written in 1559, um, and what started out as a mere 100 pages or so, in the final English edition numbers over 1500. This work would become the classic statement of Protestantism of the Reformed type, and it, it is a great read, and there's actually an entire class, a covenant, um, that I've taught on this work, so I would re recommend that. The work is structured around these two concepts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of humanity, and we see this even in the opening line of the Institutes, where Calvin says, nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say, true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. The knowledge of God comes first, knowing his holiness, his goodness, and his grace. And from knowing God, we can know ourselves as his creature, in our sinfulness, and in our redemption. So in Calvin, he structures the entire book around these two themes, uh, this called duplex cogniti, uh, these two knowledges. The first book is the knowledge of God the Creator, as we see him presented in the scriptures and through creation. The second book is knowledge of God the Redeemer, including discussions of the nature of Christ, nature of the Spirit. Book three is the application of salvation. How is it that we move from being sinful? Um, knowledge of ourselves first as created, then as created yet sinful, and then knowledge of ourselves as saved, and how has this come about? And then book four deals with how do we live communally as the people of God and the doctrine of the church. I would really recommend that one read Calvin's Institutes if you have time. There's very much to, uh, to go into in Calvin's theology, not just in small points, but everything. Uh, Calvin very much sought to bring all of the Christian religion um, from the Word of God. In fact, he said that we can only understand the world, rightly, the world itself rightly when we see it through the spectacles of Scripture, with our hearts enlivened by the Holy Spirit to come to him. Uh, in many ways, Calvin follows after the Luther, the, the theology of Luther and Zwingli, combining them together in their best points. But one doctrine I should mention, given its prominence within the history of the church, is Calvin's doctrine of salvation and how he, um, in some ways, fulfills the full Augustinian view uh, that has been missing since Augustine himself. Luther also held to this view in his early work. And this has often included the doctrine of predestination. So I, I just want to clarify some of the points here before we move on. So if salvation is by God's grace alone through faith alone, that means that there is nothing that we can do to contribute to salvation. If that is the case, how is it that we are saved? What's the difference between my response to the word and my neighbor's response to the word who does not come to faith? This is where Calvin begins in the last edition of the Institutes asking the question, why are there various responses to the preached word? How is it that one comes to believe God and the other doesn't? And Calvin concludes, quite rightly, um, that if we find that difference within the person, we're back to works. If the difference between my response to the preached word is salvation, if that comes from within me, something different about me, um, then I have myself to thank for salvation. I have myself to boast upon. And as Paul teaches, we very clearly cannot boast in our own salvation. This is purely the act of God. And so Calvin reaches back to the thought of Augustine, as well as does both Luther and Zwingli on this point, um, and to very much the thought of Paul, how are we saved? And if it is not in us, it must be in God. Therefore, God who foreknows all things, he knows what will happen because he is eternal, he transcends all time. God himself chooses who he will save. This is understood in the act of predestination. Before we do anything, God has chosen us for salvation or to not save. Since salvation is not based on human action, but it is on faith, which is a gift of God, God has eternally determined whom he will grant the gift of faith, without regard to the worth or the acts of any human being. If this is the case, salvation is purely by God's grace, and we cannot presume that we have had anything to do with it. This is often a very controversial doctrine, um, and I would... Um, love to talk about it more with you. But one thing is Calvin is not trying to speculate here. He's trying to understand what does Paul mean when he talks about predestination in places like Ephesians 1 and Romans 9, and try to understand the implications that salvation comes purely by the grace of God. Calvin has no interest in trying to peer into the nature of God's mind, but to understand the revealed truth of God 
that salvation comes purely by God's interceding into a human life, that sinful part of us that has corrupted our heart, our mind, our will, and everything that we are, making us unable to choose God, can only be changed if God reaches down and by his act of grace reforms us, regenerates us, gives us the gift of faith that we might come to know Christ, that we might come to love him, be united with him, have his righteousness, come into proper relationship with the Father, and live out our holy existence before him. This is what Calvin is trying to secure with predestination. If God is the one who does salvation, he will bring it to an end, and he has always known. There's many other questions with that um, that we can leave for another time, but I thought I should mention that Calvin sees this as a very hopeful doctrine. It gives people assurance. And he says, don't wonder if don't look for assurance of salvation in yourself, trying to find out if you're elect. That's not really your job. The salvation of God is found in his assurance of promise in Christ, that no matter how far we might feel from him, if we cast ourselves purely on Christ, we can trust that Christ will never let us go, that we can never even jump out of his hands, but we are completely secure in the grace of our Father that has been secured by the blood of the incarnate God, who is also our brother. So this is what Calvin wants from this doctrine, and, and I would have many things to recommend to you to read further. Spreading out from Calvin's thought, which we, as I said, could go into much more extensively, Calvinism spreads. Um, I should discuss briefly the term Calvinism reformed. Um, they should be taken more or less anonymously. Um, reformed is a more accurate term. The term Calvinism seems to indicate that this tradition is largely just reproducing Calvin, which is not the case. There are many other figures in the Swiss Reformation um, and beyond who influenced this tradition in important ways, such as Heinrich Bollinger, Zwingli's successor at Zurich, and people like Peter Martyr Vermigli, who was an Italian uh, who also worked in Zurich, who was very influential in this. But the message of Calvin and the Reformed tradition spreads throughout Europe. It finds a great reception in France in what will become known as the Huguenots. These uh, communities are later uh, forced out of France for various reasons. It takes great hold in the Netherlands and is one of the unifying forces that allows the Netherlands to rebel against the, uh, the rule of Spain. It also takes deep root in Scotland through the preaching of John Knox, as well as in England, which we'll talk about more how that works out next time. Uh, and also, if you'll note on the map, it also takes root in Hungary. Even to this day, a third of the uh, population of Hungary are part of a Reformed church. So uh, that's something that people generally don't know. But Calvin's views spread far and wide. While the Lutheran tradition, while it does spread, kind of restricts itself to the Holy Roman Empire in German lands and Scandinavia. Um, and so we have these two traditions that separate at Marburg and then move into different kind of regional and ethnic communities, which is the reason that even in America, the kind of genealogies of Lutheranism and the Reformed traditions will follow these same genealogies that they had in old Europe. So we're almost to the end here. I'd just like to briefly overview the nature of the Reformation's theology through what are called the five solas. The first being sola scriptura, that is scripture alone. The Bible is, for the Protestants, the final and authoritative source of our knowledge of God and how to live. This is a rejection of the Catholic position of Scripture and tradition as both sources of theology. Now, I should say that sola scriptura does not mean that the Protestants reject the importance of councils, the importance of the fathers, and the theologians. They are worth reading. They are worth learning from because the Holy Spirit is perfecting the church in our understanding of the word. But when it comes to what do we base our doctrine on, what is the final authority for how we ought to live, and what is true, it is the Bible alone, and no human tradition can be put over it, or could, can a Christian be demanded to fulfill it um, if it is not in the word of God. The next sola is sola gratia. It is by grace alone. We are saved purely by God's grace, his unmerited favor, his kindness to us that he is completely free to give um, or withdraw. And there is nothing else that our salvation is based on. This rejects the medieval view of merit and of our cooperation with grace. There is no act that we can contribute to our salvation. It is the grace of God from beginning to end with no um, contribution on our part. The next is sola fide. By faith alone. 
what justifies us or makes us righteous before God is not any sort of works or even willing, but it is the faith that God has given us as a gift. So it is not by works of any sort. This rejects salvation by faith and works and any combination thereof that you'll still find in some Protestant traditions, um, but also in the Roman Catholic Church. This is the faith that one has in Christ, in Christ's finished work on the cross to cover all of our sins and bring us into communion with the Father. The next is solus Christus. It is by Christ alone. Christ alone is the source, mediator, and securer of our salvation. He is the only mediator between God and man. He is the only one who can redeem us from our sins because he is fully God, fully man, and has paid our debt by his death and brought in us, brought us new life by his resurrection. And this is therefore a rejection of the medieval concept of the mediation of the priests and the mediation of salvation through the sacraments. There is no need to have any other mediator between God and man other than Jesus Christ and faith in him. This brings us to the other, which is sola deo gloria, to God alone be the glory. Uh, and this is in some ways the entire ethos of especially the Reformed tradition that it is only God who should be glorified, worshipped, and honored. But in the Reformation, this primarily refers to that all worship and honor should be given only to God. That our reverence, our worship is restricted to the divine and not to any creature. We worship Christ alone because he is fully God and man. Okay? Nothing else can be worshipped. We worship Christ and therefore the Father and through, this, through the Spirit. And this is a rejection of the Roman Catholic doctrine of the veneration of Mary and the saints, which the Reformers saw as giving the honor due to God to a creature. And so this is rejected as well. So this is where both the Lutherans and the Reformed in the time of the Reformation agree. I do want to note a couple of areas where the Lutheran and the Reformed traditions end up diverging. The first is, as we've seen, the nature of the sacraments, both baptism and the Lord's Supper. There also develops a distinction between the two traditions on predestination and the preservation of the saints, or that once one is saved, you will be kept and cannot even leave because God will keep you, secure you in that salvation. While Luther and Calvin pretty much agree on these points, the later Lutheran tradition following the work of Luther's protege, Philip Melanchthon, will weaken the doctrine of predestination and its emphasis in the Lutheran tradition and will hold that one can, in fact, reject God's grace. And so one can be once saved and then leave the faith in the Lutheran tradition, while the Reformed tradition rejects that. They also diverge on church structure. Uh, the Lutheran church does not care as much about the, the nature of polity, church discipline, and those things, because of Luther's emphasis much more on justification by faith. Um, the, the church structure... And as we'll see, liturgy and worship and images are left un unreformed in uh, the Lutheran churches. While this emphasis coming out of Swingley, trying to put the entire church under the word of God, means that the, the Reformed tradition will care much more for creating a church structure that is in full accord with the word of God and removing all human traditions. They will reform worship more drastically, um, as we saw with Swingley removing um, removing images from the worship space entirely, and even reforming music to fit this. So this is the other main difference. And one final thing I'll note is there's a difference between their understanding of how the two testaments relate to one another. One of the main elements of Luther's theology is this law-gospel distinction. The law in Luther primarily shows us our sin. And in seeing our inability to keep the law, we must turn back to the grace of Christ. And Luther sees this law-grace distinction throughout both the Old and New Testament. The Old Testament is almost completely law. It is there to show us our inadequacy, our lack of holiness, and therefore drive us to the cross. Well, there's something to that. The Reformed um, generally see the law in a more positive light. They don't have kind of a simple dichotomy between the two and see the, the Old and New Testament unified in covenant theology, that the two Testaments are bound together by the story of redemption that is told through the covenants that God makes with his people. So the Old Testament is very much our book, and we can see true things in the law of God and in the Old Testament um, without in some ways jumping immediately to Christ. We can see more in there if we appreciate the development of the covenants. And this idea of the covenants comes out very quickly at the time of the Reformation, primarily through um, Zwingli's successor, Heinrich Bollinger.
So just wanted to set something out. These are the similarities between the Lutheran and the Reformed tradition and some of the differences that develop over the 16th century. Next time, we're going to look at the, the Reformation as it spreads beyond Switzerland and Germany, looking at how the Reformation comes to England and how the Catholic Church responds to the Reformation with, in some ways, tidying up its own house. We're going to look at some great figures next time, such as Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, Charles Cranmer. Uh, we're going to look at um, <coughs> sorry, the founding of the Jesuits and missions to the East as well. So I look forward to seeing you next time. And have a great day.